I've been working in the field of HIV prevention, information and support for almost 18 years now. And I would say that this last year has been one of the most exciting periods I've known. After years of annual increases in new HIV diagnoses in the UK, particularly among gay and bisexual men, we've just started to see those numbers decline. 516th Street, the London Clinic, that uh, diagnoses just over 11% of the UK's HIV cases, reported a 40% drop among their gay and bisexual service users at Christmas last year. And they've recently announced that they expect to see a similar drop again this year. We've grown in our confidence in our ability to treat HIV. Although some still experience adverse effects, the numbers are now relatively small. We've moved on from discussing life expectancy to a greater examination of life quality. Increasingly, we need to look at the comorbidities associated with ageing and HIV and the emotional burden of HIV stigma, which are still serious issues. But it's a luxury that we can only afford now that so few, are, that so few are dying. The focus has shifted from preventing AIDS to promoting health. And although I speak of London specifically, it's my hometown, we've also seen extraordinary developments around the world. In New York, San Francisco, and Sydney, to name just a few, we've recently seen stories of progress in reducing new diagnoses, again, particularly among gay and bisexual men. But internationally, we're not just making progress with this group. Swaziland, which 15 years ago had the highest HIV infection rates in the world, has seen the number of new infections halved over a five-year period as the proportion of people on antiretroviral treatment with fully suppressed viral load has doubled. We've seen successful rollout of PrEP in rural communities in Kenya. Cautiously, we are on track to meet the UNAIDS 1990-90 targets by 2020. When we are undetectable, we do not pass the virus on to sexual partners. Supplementing the traditional prevention mix of condoms and varying forms of negotiated safety with PrEP and programs that support increased testing and early access to treatment has led to reductions in HIV diagnoses. Without wanting to brush the remaining considerable challenges that people with HIV continue to face under the carpet, it feels like there's a lot of good news that we should want to share. And sharing, communication, has always been central to the work that I'm most interested in. I spent 17 years working for GMFA, the gay men's health charity. GMFA had a reputation for delivering work that was a bit edgy. We weren't afraid to use explicit imagery in our campaigns. It helped to get attention and editorial. We used the same language about sex that gay men generally used with each other, conversationally. To the best of my knowledge, we were the first HIV prevention agency to mention, even guardedly, the impact that HIV treatment has on transmission risk in a public campaign. And to give some sense of perspective, that was in 2002. GMFA was also one of the first HIV health promotion agencies to engage with social media. And there was a time when people praised us for being really forward-looking because we were huge on MySpace. Just over a year ago, I left GMFA to join the team at NAM, providers of the AIDS map website and other information resources for people living with HIV and their healthcare providers. When I was at GMFA, NAM was always my go-to place for data and news about HIV. NAM has been around since 1987. It was founded by volunteers at the London Lesbian and Gay Switchboard so that they could respond to the panic that the AIDS crisis had generated. The UK government's HIV awareness campaign, featuring icebergs and tombstones, had just come out. There was widespread fear and extensive misinformation about HIV and AIDS, much of it confused and homophobic. A group of switchboard volunteers created a source of calm, authoritative and trustworthy information for people concerned about HIV. NAM quickly became the UK's primary source of HIV information. Since then, NAM's users have grown and diversified within the UK and worldwide. 
We're constantly adapting our information to take account of new needs and developments and exploring new platforms to share our information. We currently publish a wide range of print, online and other digital materials for all communities affected by HIV and those working to support them. Each year, our reach grows. Last year alone, our website, AIDSMAP, received close to 6.5 million visits from people from every country in the world. Increasingly, people access online services using handheld devices, and this has contributed to large increases in visits from countries with rapidly growing access to digital services, including many countries in sub-Saharan Africa. Taking over the leadership of NAM, I wanted to preserve what is valued, the authority and comprehensiveness of the information that we provide. However, I felt we needed to be doing more to be proactive in our approach. It's no longer enough to wait for people to come to us for information. The doom-laden images of death, tombstones and icebergs from the campaigns of the 1980s still cast a long shadow. We need to ensure that all people know what it means that know that what it means to be living with HIV has changed and social media can help us do that so today I'm going to look at four pieces of social media work all of which I've been connected to in some way and each of which tackle a core message that I believe deserves to be communicated widely in doing so I hope to be able to provide some thoughts about what may work and what doesn't work and also consider both the benefits and some of the potential costs of supporting HIV health using social media. For World AIDS Day two years ago, when I was at GMFA, we wanted to do some work which challenged the acceptability of the stigmatisation of gay men with HIV. We got a bunch of guys who agreed to go on camera and talk about their HIV status, and their nude photos, because it was GMFA, and interviews graced a copy of our magazine FS. While we had them in for the photo shoot, which didn't take place in any glamorous studio, but rather in our small, rather grotty offices in Old Street, we invited them to take part in a video reading mean dating app messages. This video was cheap, and it looked it. But we got lucky with our models, who were smart, articulate, unapologetic, and sassy. And although the messages they read out were sometimes hurtful, these men weren't victims. The video got over 100,000 views in its first week. And it got coverage in, among others, the Daily Mail, BuzzFeed, Huffington Post, Gay Times, Pink News, Gay Star News, the Irish Examiner. It had a much bigger impact than any of us expected. With hindsight, we perhaps should have talked to the participants more about the impact it could have on their lives. But to be honest, we didn't realize it was going to take off as it did. We weren't able to measure we have had any direct impact on stigma. We saw increases in traffic to our web pages, and we saw evidence that the video itself prompted discussions. But that's not what social media is about. Social media isn't going to be the best tool for behavior change, but it can contribute to attitudinal change. It was in November 2010 that the New England Journal of Medicine announced that Travada could re reduce the risk of HIV-negative gay men contracting the virus by 90%. Further studies established that PrEP also worked for heterosexual men and women. The CDC amended its guidance for HIV prevention, recommending PrEP to high infection risk populations in May 2014. Even before this, it was being prescribed in the US and health insurers were even happy to pay for it because PrEP was so much cheaper than HIV healthcare. But progress towards PrEP rollout in the UK and in many other countries across Europe was and remains glacial. HIV activists from across the UK started to build a movement to, to demand that PrEP be made available. <coughs> Colleagues from Terence Higgins Trust, GMFA, the National AIDS Trust, NAM, activists from I Want Prep Now and Prepster, and other agencies met together. We agreed to work collaboratively to lobby for Prep rollout. We were united for Prep. And this is noteworthy because the HIV sector in the UK doesn't always work well together. Partly this is due to increased competition for very rapidly reduced levels of funding. 
but also because PrEP was and still remains a controversial solution to the challenge of HIV infections. Much of the UK's right-wing media opposed PrEP as a lifestyle drug. People at risk of HIV were pitched against cancer sufferers or children with challenging medical conditions. The racism and homophobia behind some of these attacks was barely concealed. And also we have to recognize that HIV organizations in other countries had not been so united. The AIDS Healthcare Foundation in California had come out quite strongly against PrEP. Reagan Hoffman, the former editor-in-chief of POS, a magazine for people living with HIV, called PrEP a profit-driven sex toy for rich Westerners. So the fact that every major HIV charity in the UK, as well as some black and minority ethnic charities and some LGBT charities, were agreed on the value of PrEP was significant. Collectively, we gave our support to the National AIDS Trust in their successful High Court challenge of the NHS's decision not to proceed with PrEP. We supported the work of the activists behind I Want PrEP Now, who facilitated access to generic supplies of PrEP for people in the UK. We shared information on the efficacy of PrEP, from the PROUD study in the UK to the IPK uh, trial in France and rollout of various PrEP programs overseas. We communicated with each other via Facebook and showed our support with actions on a range of social media platforms, including Twitter and Instagram. For the first time in at least 20 years, the HIV organisations marched together at Pride under the United for PrEP banner. Social media supported this collective effort to establish an identity. It facilitated communication both within the grouping and to the wider population. And it gave us opportunities to challenge the negative reporting around PrEP and helped us to build a social movement demanding PrEP on the NHS. As I mentioned before, GMFA first started public discussion of the impact of treatment on prevention 15 years ago. And we got considerable amounts of kickback on this because people were saying, well, you can't use any message other than use a condom every time. If you do so, it's a kind of betrayal. But recently, we've seen a growing level of activism to ensure that the preventative be benefits of treatment are known and understood. The Prevention Access Campaign's consensus statement on the impact of an undetectable viral load on sexual transmission risk, which is on the slide, has now been endorsed by over 360 different organisations from 49 different countries. The Prevention Access Campaign was founded by Bruce Richman, a Harvard graduate living with HIV, who was outraged that this information was being withheld from people with HIV who were deemed by some to be too irresponsible to handle the message. Bruce's activism demonstrates the value of personal passion for a project. Getting an agreement to the statement was just the start. Once I signed NAM up to it, I got badgered by Bruce to do more. We were agreed that sharing the message that undetectable equals untransmittable was not only important in and of itself, but that it also could have an impact upon other aspects of the epidemic. It underlined the importance of effective HIV testing programs and of universal access to HIV treatment for those diagnosed. It challenged some of the stigmatizing attitudes too often expressed towards people living with HIV. The benefit of using social media for this campaign was that anyone could get involved. Utilizing the U equals U hashtag on Twitter, people all around the world could be part of a movement, spreading an empowering message. A lot of people living with HIV seized the opportunity to be part of something that addressed a root cause of HIV stigma. I would say that this message still hasn't penetrated far enough, but the campaign is far from over. Some challenges it's worth mentioning the U equals U hashtag on its own isn't enough to communicate the message. It does require further explanation. Also, U equals U doesn't work globally because it doesn't translate into all other languages. The U equals U message, like much on social media, is blunt. 
it has in some instances become unlinked to the sexual transmission risk which it's intended to refer to, which is problematic. And it fails to capture the complexity of scientific assessments of risk or the difficulties of describing any outcome as impossible. The final example I'm going to use is a personal one. I was diagnosed with HIV in 1998. It was a couple of years after the Vancouver conference, which heralded the arrival of effective combination therapy. I reckon at the time that I was going to live to about 50. So when I approached 50, I thought, well, should I say something about this? Should I mention it as my birthday party? Would that be a bit of a downer? Um, but actually, I, I didn't feel that my HIV status was something that should be hidden or ignored. I, I had been living with the virus for almost 20 years, and I was still healthy. And this was a golden opportunity to talk about this, to counter the images of early death that are still so associated with HIV. This was only good news. So, with these thoughts going through my head, I sent a tweet thanking people who had wished me a happy birthday via Twitter. And I made reference to the fact that I had reached my goal of 50 and I felt good about it. And I don't normally get too personal on Twitter because mainly I just want to link to articles that I've read and I think are interesting or I want to promote work around LGBT equality or HIV prevention that I think deserves to be seen. Sometimes I make really, really bad jokes. Um, but in this instance, I wanted people to know the good news about the effectiveness of HIV treatment. I wanted to challenge the stigma and the discrimination that people living with HIV face, all too often from within the communities that are most affected. There's no need for those of us living with HIV to be fearful or ashamed. On effective treatment, we can live long and full lives and we do not pose a transmission risk to our sexual partners. We are not limited by this virus. Hundreds of thousands of people saw this tweet. Thousands engaged with it. One gay website wrote a story about it, which was really embarrassing. I was quite prepared to come out of the closet as someone living with HIV. I hadn't realized I was going to come out of the closet as someone who's 50. And although the message was considered, I hadn't anticipated it would go so far. And this is one of the challenges of using social media. Sometimes you might think you have the perfect, pithy, 140-character message which you hope will be seen and taken to heart by the world. And sometimes it will. And often it won't. And there are things you can do to boost your profile or encourage sharing, but they may not always work. There is an element of good or bad fortune with whether your social media messaging will have any impact. <laughs> Although I'm on some social media platforms, and usually I enjoy it, I would say I have an ambivalence towards it. Social media has changed the world rapidly, perhaps even bewilderingly, in the few years that we've had it. We're only now starting to be aware of how profoundly its impact how profound its impact has been. And it's hard to argue that its influence has been entirely positive. Its power to abuse and the abuse of its power should give us all pause. But Pandora's box is open. Social media, like the printing press or the internet, has changed the way that we communicate. We can turn our backs on it. We can work to erase as much of our digital footprint as possible. Or we can stick with it counter those who use it for hate, and try and use it for good. As I said at the start, I believe this is a particularly exciting time to be involved with HIV. Combination prevention is starting to have an impact on new diagnoses among a range of populations in a range of settings globally. People with HIV who have access to treatment can expect to live long, healthy, and productive lives. Effective treatment also means that we don't pose a risk to our sexual partners. These twin impacts of HIV treatment challenge the fear that continues to surround the virus, often expressed as stigma. Challenging stigma, spreading the good news about the effectiveness of treatment, not only supports people living with the virus, it can also remove some of the barriers to testing encouraging people to be diagnosed earlier and have faster access to treatment, which reduces their risk of death and of passing the virus on. 
all of these activities and messages are interrelated and interdependent. We should not be limited in our ambitions. Through education and support, we can encourage testing, prevent new infections, assist adherence, challenge stigma, and through all of these actions, support people living with HIV. I believe that ignorance compounds HIV stigma. I believe there is good news about HIV to share, be shared, and I believe that we should use all of the tools at our disposal to share it. Thank you.